Good morning and welcome to Hendersonville Seventh Day Adventist Church. So glad you are here. God, like to Abraham, has a threefold message for you. He has a calling for you, those who are online as well. He has a blessing, an abundant blessing that only gets better each day, and he wants to make you a blessing to others. You may remain seated as we begin to worship God in music this morning. We'll be singing together, Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy, honor the day that our Lord commands us to cease our toiling, and we obey. be heard, for we adore Him and lift our hearts in praise, keeping the Sabbath holy in all our Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we invite the presence of the living God to fall afresh on us today. Father, we ask that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Happy Sabbath. It is great to see each and every one of you. We're glad that you joined us here at the Hendersonville Seventh Avenue Church for worship. Those that are watching online, we're glad that you are here as well. My name is Jeff Harper. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are glad that you are in God's house with us today. It's a beautiful day, isn't it? With a lot of rain this past week, I'm thankful for a sunny forecast this week and some warm weather that uh, is on its way this afternoon uh, is going to be nice as well. We can uh, look forward to that. We want to invite all of you to join us for our fellowship lunch, which is downstairs. And just earlier, I was down there speaking with Pat uh, Battenberg. Some of you uh, may know this, but in case you don't, it is a miracle that Pat is downstairs. And Pat, if you're watching, we just want to say we are so glad that you are here. Not too long ago, uh, Basically, uh, you know, uh, she was pronounced, you know what, she's not going to make it. And her husband had the choice, do you want to keep on fighting or not? And he could have let her go, but he said, we want to keep on fighting. And because of that and because of God's healing, she is with us. And we're so grateful for that. So we praise God for that. And if you're downstairs and you see uh, Pat, just uh, tell her happy Sabbath and, and uh, glad that uh, she is here. Uh, we also wanted to ask that you continue to pray for the Daniel Fast, which is uh, continuing. Tonight is another program, and a big thanks to all of the volunteers uh, who are making that happen. But let's be praying for that wonderful ministry that is uh, taking place this evening at 6 p.m. And it looks like uh, there's a sunshine band happening, is that correct, uh, this afternoon at 3.30 p.m., uh, so that's over at the Laurels facility on Clear Creek Road, uh, 3.30, thank you, did I say 3, forgive me, 3.30 p.m. Uh, over uh, there at the Laurels, so take note of that. And also, um, I don't know, is Cheryl Griffin here today? Uh, I didn't uh, see her, but uh, wanted to let you all know something exciting that's happening uh, here in a 
couple of weeks, uh, I guess uh, less than that, about a week, uh, Cheryl Griffin has planned an outreach uh, on this coming Wednesday. Um, so it's just a few days away. This coming Wednesday and Thursday, uh, there's going to be here in Hendersonville at the Epic Theater a film that will be showed called The Hopeful. And it's a film made by the Sim Davenist Church, and Cheryl had the great idea to pass out great controversies to those that are attending this. Um, they're watching a film about the history of how this church started, and why not give them a book that tells them more about that history. So if you are interested in that outreach, and I encourage you to be interested in it, uh, but if you are, then at 6.40 p.m., uh, you can meet at Epic Theater, and they'll be passing out to those people both on Wednesday and on Thursday night. So let's uh, take note of, of that. Uh, and also, you'll see on the back of your bulletin that coming up in, in April, there's a mom's brunch. Uh, and that is for all of the moms that currently have kids in the home encourage you to sign up. Uh, there's an opportunity to do that here. There's a link in the back of your bulletin. You can talk to Judith as well. Uh, or if you get our newsletter, you can sign up that way. Um, but we look forward to that. Uh, also notice in coming events that May 10 through 12, which is coming up rather soon, is our uh, biannual, twice a year, church campout. Our spring uh, campout is coming up at Table Rake Rock State Park. Uh, my wife and I just got a campsite this past week, and there's about six or seven campsites left. So if you enjoy camping and being outside, there will be a group that weekend that are enjoying uh, God's nature. So let's uh, keep that in mind as well. Um, and I think that's all of our announcements. So we're glad that you're here, and we'll continue praising God in song. Let's continue our worship by singing together as the deer. We'll sing all three in verses. You may remain seated as we sing. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield, Praising the Lord today, let's stand together as we sing, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. Watch carefully. Child and forever I am. We 
I cannot be silent, His love is the theme of my Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, how I love to proclaim it, His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the key. Light, delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me song in the night. Redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. Redeem, how I love to proclaim it, His child and Please be seated. Happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. Did everybody have a good week despite the rain? Did the rain seem kind of gloomy, like life sometimes? Um, I'm going to start off this morning in the footsteps of the elder from last week, Joe Hensky. Is, does anybody have anything they'd like to praise the Lord for this morning? Amen. Sometimes I think we can get bogged down with life and life struggles. Um, but I think came across this uh, little quote uh, a couple weeks ago in a little devotional book in Heavenly Places. It's from March 29, and I would invite you to, to look it up and read the whole thing, read the days before and after. It's very encouraging. Um, and it goes like this. In just a little time, Christ will come in power and great glory. And what a terrible thing it would be if we should not be ready. Let us get ready at once. Separate evil from you. Begin to sing the song of praise and rejoice in here below. Let your lips be tuned to praise God. Angels in heaven are praising God all the time. And here are mortals for whom Christ left the heavenly home and suffered mockery, insult, and death that he might, that he might lift us up to sit in heavenly places. If you sit in heavenly places with Christ, you cannot refrain from praising God. Begin to elevate your tongues to praise Him and train your hearts to make melody to God. It, and this is what's going to happen when you do that. And when, e when the evil one begins to settle his gloom about you, sing praise to God. When things go crossways at your homes, Strike up a song about the matchless charms of the Son of God. And I tell you, when you touch this strain, Satan will leave you. You can drive out the enemy with his gloom, and you can see oh so much clearer the love and compassion of your Heavenly Father. I know most of us here get our prayer chain. Um, I just invite you to look at that. Uh, not just what happened this week, but in the weeks to, to pass, in the past. Uh, and, and lift these folks up. Uh, this, this week, uh, some things that had come through are Ed, Esther Rodriguez's sister is losing her battle with cancer. So we want to lift Esther and her family up, especially her her sister. Um, we had Skip McDonnell. Uh, he had a co-worker this week whose father was admitted to the hospital. We want to continue to lift up our, our elder 
Dave Johnson with his uh, continued chemo treatments, which I understand are going well and things are shrinking. Uh, B.J. Jones has been battling our uh, insurance company. Uh, somebody else has her name and is causing trouble. So we, we want to lift her up. We want to remember Teresa Bass, uh, who is uh, battling cancer and who had surgery this week. Also, uh, we want to, we got a prayer of praise for Wayne Kimbrough's successful cataract surgery. Um, and then we want to lift up Nicole Carnes' friend, James, who possibly could be dealing with cancer as well. And then we want to lift up Carmelita as she's recovering from a fall from playing with her grandkids. Um, it's looking like she may have surgery this next week, next Friday. Um, and we want to, uh, lastly, we want to lift up um, Alicia um, Crabtree's nephew, David, who has been in the hospital with pancreatitis. Does anyone here have a prayer concern or praise that they would like to bring before the Lord? Will you kneel with me as far as possible? Have Father God, we come humbly before you this morning and just ask you to forgive us where we've fallen short. Uh, thank you for your forgiveness, your grace, your love, and your watchful care over each one of us. Lord, we want to uh, praise you this morning. We have so much to be thankful for. We're thankful for this church and all its ministries, for the friendship and fellowship we have with each one here. And we just lift this church up to you. Lord, we also want to lift up our prayer chain. There are people that are praising you for good outcomes and, and things that are improved. But Lord, there's people that's in the throes of difficulty. We want to lift those up to you as well. Um, Father, just be with this service here today. Be with our pastor as he presents your word to us. We just ask the Holy Spirit to be upon him. Help us to listen and help us to share what we learn. And we just invite you here today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now's the time for our children's story. For those of you that don't know, our, our kids will be taking up a love offering. People uh, will be holding up some 20s and 100s, hopefully. Um, but it assists our, our young people in a Christian education. And they can pick it up at this time. Preston Black will be having our children's story today.
Good morning, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. So a couple of weeks ago, my girls were out on spring break, and they were so excited that we decided last minute to go camping. So we de-winterized the camper, got it ready, checked everything over. We were ready to go. And so after church on Sabbath afternoon, getting ready to go into South Union, we started driving. And we had five hours to get to the campground where we were going. And so we start down the road. And as we're going down the road, we're driving down I-85, doing about 70 miles an hour, cruising right along. And as we're passing by a semi-truck, I see a little debris up ahead on the road. And I thought, uh-oh. So I scooched over as close as I could to the semi-truck to try and miss it, and I missed it with the truck tires. And then as I looked in my rearview mirror, I see the debris shooting off into the median as the trailer had hit it. And I go, oh no. And Miss Claire looked at me, she goes, what's the matter? I'm like, ah, we hit a little debris, let's see. And we kept going for a few seconds, and I didn't feel anything, and everything was okay. And about 20 seconds later, a semi-truck pulls up beside me, and he honks his horn at me and points over his shoulder. And guess what had happened? We had popped a tire. Yep, popped a tire, going down the interstate, and I look up ahead, and there's two tires. It's a double axle trailer, so the front one was still there, but we had popped the rear one, and I thought, I really don't want to have to change a tire right on the side of the interstate. I'm going to see if I can make it the next half a mile and get off the interstate. So we kind of limped along, and we did. We made it. We got off the interstate. We pulled into the first little open parking lot that kind of connected a little strip mall and a Burger King and all these things. And so I get out, and it's time to start changing a tire. And literally, I just stepped out of the truck, and a little car pulls up beside me. And he goes, ah, it looks like you got some trouble. And I said, I do. And he goes, well, do you have everything you need to fix it? And I said, I should be okay, because we were loaded up. And I even remember when I bought the camper, they showed me where the little toolkit was to change all the tires and where all the tools were. And I know how to change a tire. So I started, and I, he said, you know, I got to go drop something off. He goes, but I'll swing back by in a few minutes. So I started going to work. I got the tools out, and I got the spare tire out. And we started jagging the trailer up. And the last thing I went and found was I found the wrench, the breaker bar. Now, this is an example of one, and you use this to take the lug nuts off a tire. That's how you get it off. Now, this one, if you look at it, it's pretty thick, right? It's pretty strong. Well, when I found the one that they had included with the camper, it was so thin, when I put it on the very first lug nut, it just bent the whole metal bar. And so now I'm sitting there thinking, well, maybe I don't have everything I need. But right as that happened, here comes this car pulling back up. And he goes, how you doing? I said, well, the breaker bar they included does not really seem to be uh, strong enough. And he goes, hold on. And he gets out of his car and he pops his trunk and he goes, my father-in-law just passed away and I was helping my mother-in-law clean out his garage today and he was a mechanic and he pulls out these two big sturdy four-way wrenches which fit everything. One of them looked real like this but it's pointed in four directions and he goes, I just picked these up this morning and she gave them to me. She goes, let's see if one of these works and we popped it on and it zipped it off no problem. So we sat there talking and he goes, you know, he goes, many years ago, somebody stopped and helped me when I had a flat tire. And he goes, and now I find that I want to stop every time I see somebody who has a flat tire. And I said, well, today you were my hero because I said we would have been in trouble not being able to get these lug nuts off. And so he stays there with me and I ask him his name. His name was Brian. So if Brian happens to be watching today, Brian's my hero. Because then he looks and he goes, you know, he goes, I don't even need either of these. He goes, I want you to just keep one so that you have one in your camper for next time. And I said, oh, that is so nice of you because Brian really helped me out that day, didn't he? And you know, there's a Bible verse that says something in Matthew 25, verse 40. It says, truly I tell you, for what you've done unto one of the least of these, my brothers or sisters, you've done unto me. Now I'm confident that I am not God. 
in that verse, but I'm also confident that I was definitely one of the least of these that day because <laughs> I did not have what I needed. And you know what's amazing about how God looks after us like that? Not only did he send Brian to help me there, but we still had three and a half hours to go, and now we had no spare tire. So we finished our trip, and we made it there, and eventually we found a spare tire around our trip, and within 10, well, about 15 minutes of driving after we had a spare tire again, the other tire on the front of the trailer blew out. But do you know what I had this time? I had all the tools that I needed because Brian had left me a four-way and now God had helped it hold together until I had that other spare ready to go on there. So 15 minutes, we changed a tire, we were back on the road and made it home all the way safe. So let's just remember that. God can look out for us in so many ways, but once in a while, one of you might be able to do something that you can become someone else's hero. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all of the great people that you put in this world. And whether Brian was an angel or I was just his way of, uh, of really just being able to show how what we can do for other people, Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that you bring us in life and the ways that you protect us. I ask you to watch over each of these kids. In your name I pray, amen. All right, and we got children's bulletins today. All right. Let's see. Dan, Dan's got the readers here. So if you're seven or older, AJ, Abel, you guys want one? Mr. Dan. How many are inspired to be a good Samaritan this week? I'm going to be extra, extra visual, thanks to Preston. Um, I also wanted to mention if anybody wanted to have private prayer time um, after the service in room seven on this side of the hallway. Um, I'll be there after the service. Um, our offering today, let me ask a question first. How many have watched Hope Channel? I see quite a few hands. Okay, so today's offering, today's loose offering is for the Hope Channel International. Um, and I have a little something to read here. Um, Give hope through your offering today. The impact of Hope Channel is evident in the inspiring stories of God's children like Pastor Ross and baby Aora. Ross became drug addiction, excuse me, <clears throat> I need my glasses actually. Believe it or not, I need reading glasses these days. Uh, Ross overcame drug addiction to become an ordained Seventh-day Adventist pastor after discovering Hope Sabbath School. Following baby Aora's bronchial plexus injury at birth, she was miraculously healed thanks to our most watched Let's Pray program and prayers on her behalf from our global community. With your offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transformational love of Jesus Christ with people all over the world by producing high quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform is online and offers Bible studies on a range of topics. So far, over 300,000 pe three, 300, people have started a course just one year after the platform went live. People hungering for Bible truth. We read in Proverbs 11:25, whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. By faithfully supporting Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others, but yourself as well by bringing hope to those who need it most and by telling them of the love of Jesus Christ. After celebrating 20 years of Hope Channel and reaching over 300 
or um, 80 countries with the Adventist message, let's make 2024 the most impactful year yet as sharing hope in Jesus with people everywhere. Will the deacons please stand? Father in heaven, thank you for the blessings you've enriched each one here with. And we just ask that you accept a portion of what you've blessed us with back. Um, and we ask a blessing on the Hope Channel. Uh, we just pray that many lives are touched and many more are brought to your kingdom because of this offering. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is 1 John 2, 3 through 6. Again, that is 1 John 2, 3 through 6. And, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love is Love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Good morning, church. Um, this morning, we're going to sing uh, a living prayer. And this song has meant a lot to me as far as like, you know, that's what I want my life to be. Um, I don't know if many are like me, where I think I could pray better, or I, if I said it the right way, I could trick God into answering my prayer, you know. Um, but that's not how it works. Prayer is not about me. Um, it's about creating this relationship with God. And this song talks about um, the relationship that He offers each one of us as we pray to Him and talk to Him daily. Um, and I read something that said, if, if we walk with the Holy Spirit, then our life will become a perpetual prayer to God. And that's what I want. And um, I hope that this song helps uh, others feel the same way. <laughs> In this world, I walk alone, oh, with no place to call my home. But there's one who holds my hand on the rugged road through 
barren lands The way is dark The road is steep But He's become My eyes to see Strength to climb My grief to bear The Savior lives Inside me there In your love I find release A haven from My unbelief Take my life And let me be A living prayer My God to Thee Through these trials of life I find Another voice inside my mind He comforts me and bids me live Inside the love the Father gives A haven from my unbelief Take my life and let me be A living prayer, my God, to Thee Take my life and let me be Beautiful song. Thank you so much. Wasn't that a blessing, church? Amen. Praise God. May our lives be a living prayer. Happy Sabbath. How are you doing? You had a good week? Yes? Praise God that we can be in his house together. I would appreciate prayers for uh, my little daughter, Eden. She uh, was not feeling well this morning and threw up and... and uh, Anyway, so we just, uh, yeah, would appreciate prayers for her. Mom stayed home with little Eden, but I have my boys here today, and I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful that we can be in God's house worshiping him and studying his word. So why don't we have a word of prayer and ask God to be with us as we dive into scripture. Father in heaven, we want to come before you, the infinite God of the universe, and Father, we somehow, your word says, can approach your throne of grace with confidence. Not because of anything that I have done or we have done, but because of Jesus. And so Father, we come this morning with confidence. Trusting in the merits of a risen and crucified Savior. We come asking for wisdom. We understand, Lord, that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We need your help. And we pray that as we study these sacred pages of Scripture, that you would guide us, that you would guide our minds into a deeper appreciation for you and a clear understanding of your plan of salvation. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. <coughs> Some of you uh, know this weekend that our senior pastor, Pastor Wright, is uh, speaking in Loma Linda. How many of you ever heard of Advent Hope Sabbath School? Yes, some of you have. Uh, he is uh, on a mission to both speak at Advent Hope Sabbath School and also to reclaim missing members. Uh, one of our own 
Josie Ann Bailey and her husband Michael are out there, and so the joke is that Pastor Wright went out there to tell them to come back, uh, which maybe uh, someday they will, right? Uh, we're, we're, we have a mother that's praying for that, uh, but we got sent this picture, and Pastor Wright sent uh, uh, my wife and I a picture of him standing in front of the church that I used to pastor at, the Mentone Church, early this morning. So it was good to see the California sun shining on Pastor Wright. But just by show of hands, how many of you commit to be praying for Pastor Wright this weekend? Amen. Uh, So as we are here today, he'll be uh, speaking there. Today's message is entitled, Why Obedience Matters. And I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard of this slogan or this clothing brand called Obey? All right, not very many of us, a couple of us, maybe some young people. Uh, But Obey was began or started in 1989 by the art and ideas of someone named Shepard Ferry. And Ferry was studying at a very prestigious art school called the Rhode Island uh, uh, Island School of Design, Rhode Island School of Design, and he came up with this sticker, and it's ended up evolving into a worldwide street art campaign, and his artwork, his design has become famous, and it's known for being suggestively anti-authoritative, anti-authoritarian. So I want to read you from their website. The Obey Campan is rooted in the do-it-yourself counterculture of punk rock. It's taking cues from popular culture, commercial marketing, and political messaging. And then notice, uh, you can see it there on the screen, uh, from their website, with biting sarcasm verging on reverse psychology. So notice when the slogan says obey, it's really saying don't obey, right? It's saying that we have the, you know, the government is telling us to do this and people are telling us to do this and we need to resist, don't obey. He goads the viewers using the imperative obey to take heed of the propagandists out to bend the world to their agendas. Now what's fascinating to me is that I think that this slogan and this clothing brand is rather indicative of the mentality that our world has today. And while I'm not promoting or demoting or saying you should watch uh, or or buy their clothing or not buy it, uh, my point is this. I believe that this campaign uh, is in, kind of shares and tells us what is happening in our world today. We live in a world that says, don't obey. We live in a world that says, you know what, you can do it yourself. Your ways are better than anyone else. It is a a world that says, you know what, you can be whatever gender you want. A world that says you can be whatever race you want. If you want to be black, go for it. Even if you were born uh, something else. If you want to be white, go for it. If you were born something else. It's a world that says you can be whoever you want because you know best. Do you agree, friends, that we live in that type of world? We live in a world that people say, my way is better than anyone else's way. You know the postmodern mantra, I have my truth, right? She has her truth, and if we just bring our different truths together, we can all get along just fine. In our postmodern world, there's no such thing as a capital T truth. No such thing as absolute truth or the truth. Be your own boss. And we could go on and on about how alarming our culture is. We could go on about how evil and terrible our culture is, but at the end of the day, the problem isn't out there, the problem is in there. The the fact that people struggle with their identity is not just their problem, but it's all of our problem. A problem struggling and forgetting that what God says is always better than what we say. The struggle to obey, the struggle to accept what God has said, the struggle to be who God created you to be, to identify with who God has identified you to be, that struggle has been the struggle from the very beginning, hasn't it, friends? Lucifer, in the very beginning, struggled to obey and trust what God told him. He was satisfied, uh, uh, he wasn't satisfied with how God made him. He didn't like what God said. He didn't want to obey God. He wanted to do his own thing. And because Lucifer wanted to be his own boss, he rebelled. And that rebellion ended up spreading to planet Earth, and the seeds of rebellion were planted here on our planet 
earth's soil, spreading its poisonous fruit to mankind. But isn't it true, friends, that Satan is tricking the world? When Satan tells the world, be your own boss, you know what is best. You can rule yourself better than God can. When Satan tells the world that, in all reality, he's telling humans, humans, you are worthless. It's a trick message. The message of, you know what, you're your own boss, you're great, do whatever you want, is actually telling humanity, you know what, you don't need yourself. You're an accident, you're a mistake, you're worthless, you're not who God created you to be. You can be happier being different. You can have more joy and more attention if you're someone else. And that message is saying that you're useless and disposable. Because God says, friends, that your value is immeasurable. Can you say amen? God says that you're worth more than you can imagine. God loves you so much that he sacrificed his own son for him to come, become one of us, to show us how to live, how to be human. And when Jesus was here on earth, he said, come to me if you're weary or heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. Friends, have you ever struggled with the question, does God really love me? I've struggled with that question before. Am I good enough? Am I good enough for God? Does God care about me? And I encourage you to ask that question to God. God, do you love me? Because every single time that I ask God that question, God, do you really love me? The verse that flashes into my mind is Jeremiah 31, verse three. Do you know that verse? I have loved thee with an everlasting love. I have drawn thee with cords of kindness. God's word says that, so do we trust that? Humanity has struggled with trusting what God has said for a long time, haven't we? From the very beginning, it's gotten us into a horrible mess. Adam and Eve struggled to believe what God said. Did did God really say not to eat of that tree? Well, I I know he said that, but maybe, maybe the way he said it wasn't exactly how we thought. Maybe we're misperceiving what he said. And Adam and Eve's disbelief and distrust of what God has said got our planet into a lot of trouble. Adam and Eve trusted what they saw and what they heard rather than what God said. And we do the same thing today, don't we? It's easy to trust our perceptions, what we see in front of us, rather than what God's word says. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. Acts chapter five. Here, Peter and the apostles are on trial again. They're on trial because they keep on preaching Jesus. They can't help but talk about Jesus. And because of that, they're getting into trouble. Is that a good problem to have? It is. Well, they couldn't help themselves. We gotta keep on talking about this guy. We gotta keep on talking about the one who saved us and loved us, and they keep on talking about Jesus. Notice, uh, we'll start in verse 26. Then the captain, this is Acts 5, verse 26. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them. (laughs) Notice their question, verse 28. Did we not command you, did we not strictly command you to not teach? in this name. And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Did we not tell you? We told you to stop preaching Jesus. We human beings told you, don't preach Jesus. And we strictly commanded you not to do this. But notice their response. Verse 29, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We know this verse. We ought to obey God rather than men. God's word is more important than man's word. What God tells us and what God says is more trustworthy and more important than what people say. 
We can trust what God says. People are going to let us down. And here Peter recognizes that even though a human being is telling him to do something, because that goes in contrary with what God told him, he's going to stick with what God told him. Even though what God told him might land him in jail, it might bring him physical harm, it might even kill him, but he doesn't care because what God's word says is more important than what man says. And I believe, friends, that that lesson is something that God wants to instill upon our hearts. That even though we, we, we live with our sinful human natures, we, we, we live with these desires to go contrary to what God says, it's hard sometimes to follow and obey. But I believe, friends, that God can give us the victory to listen to and obey his word. I believe that God wants us to listen to him more than we listen to people. We're going to come back here to Acts, and uh, this verse is not on the screen, but I invite you to turn with me to the book of Luke. Go with me to the book of Luke now, Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 13. Let's notice what the Bible says. But the angel said to him, and this is talking about or talking to Zacharias. So here is the angel talking to Zacharias. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and if you want, you shall call his name John. Is that what it says? You know what, if the rest of the village thinks that you should call him John, there's, mo- there's, there's wisdom in the, in, the, in the council of many, call him John if you can. Is that what it says? No. It says, you shall call him John. Was that a command from God? Yes, that was a directive from God himself. Hey, Elizabeth, Zacharias, I have a special mission for you. Your mission is to raise this young boy to be the forerunner to Jesus. Is that a special mission? The the mission to prepare the way for the Lord. That's a mission that we all have. John the Baptist prepared the world for Jesus' first coming, and our job is to prepare the world for Christ's second coming. This was an important mission that Zacharias and Elizabeth had, and God had specific instructions for them. I want you to call his name John. Now we know the story. Zacharias doubted what God told him. Really? Are you sure, God? He had doubt. And because of that, what happened to him? Right? He was mute for uh, uh, s- several uh, uh, months. He was mute for a long period of time. But let's go ahead and jump down to verse 57. So Luke chapter 1, verse 57. <clears throat> so here we are. We're skipping forward in the story We just read how the angel had told Elizabeth and Zacharias that they're going to have a a baby. He's going to have a special mission. They were supposed to call him John. Verse 57, now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth his son. Can you say amen? Right? We rejoice when people are brought into this world, when babies are born. Verse 58, when her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. Elizabeth was past the age of childbearing, wasn't she? And so here, her neighbors and relatives are doing a good thing. They're rejoicing with her because they say, you know what? You should not have a baby, but God provided for you. And we can praise God. Should our friends and family rejoice when God has worked on our behalf? Yes. I, we, we want that lesson to be instilled in our family. We're always telling our, our, our kids this, you know? When someone else succeeds in the family, we want to value and appreciate and applaud their success. We don't have to be mad if they do something better. We can say, you know what, praise God that that happened to them. So the neighbors and relatives of Elizabeth and Zacharias are are praising God. So notice verse 59. So it was on the eighth day, this is Luke chapter one, verse 59. So it was on the eighth day, just eight days later, they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. Remember, Zacharias at this point in time is mute. And they would have called his name Zacharias, but verse 60, his mother answered and said no. 
he shall be called John. Can you say amen? amen. Elizabeth trusted what God said. And she put her faith in what God's word told her. And she said, I'm going to call him by what God told me to call him. Now notice the next verse, verse 61. But they said to her, who's they? Friends and relatives. Remember, we just read, there's, there's people around Elizabeth that are rejoicing that she just had a baby. And they start saying to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. Friends, I want to tell you this. Often in our lives, people that we love, people that we cherish, people that we trust, influence us to do things that God doesn't want us to do. Sometimes, friends, people that we honor, we, we value their opinion, their family, and they start whispering in our ears that's really not the best idea. You really shouldn't do that, but we know God has called us this direction. And I believe, friends, that God is telling us that despite what people say, even if they're our family, even if they're our friends, even if they're our sons and our daughters, that we need to trust what God's word says first before what people say. Because people can lead us astray. I was telling this story last night to uh, some of the youth that were at our house for a youth vespers, uh, but... There's a pastor, a Seventh Avenue pastor that we've mentioned before named Don McClafferty. He wrote the material that we, we studied for our small groups and he tells a story of how he was in California. He had a, a comfortable job, a full-time job. He was employed by the Central California Conference, uh, which is similar to our Carolina Conference, just the organization that leads out all the churches in that area. He had a, a, a steady paycheck every month uh, you know, he had kids that were in college. He had kids that were in school that they were paying for. And God clearly told him and his wife to leave their well-paying, I shouldn't say well-paying, their steady-paying, pastors don't get well-paid, but their steady-paying job, and to leave that behind and to live by faith. To not rely on a salary, but to rely on God to sustain you. Now, if God told you that, would you do it? That's a, that's a challenging command. They had kids in school. They had people to take care of. That was a challenging command. And even before, because they knew that God had told them, the same voice that had spoken to this family time and time again, they trusted God's word. They trusted his voice. They knew this was God leading them. And even before anyone else, because they knew the moment they started calling relatives, hey, guess what? I just quit my job. Oh, great. Where are you working next? I don't have one. Well, how are you going to pay for your kid's college bill? They're going to Southern. I don't know yet, but God's going to provide. They knew the moment they started making those calls, they would start getting chirps from their family. Ah, that's not a good idea. Oh, should you rethink that? Is, is God really calling you? So prior to talking to any of their family, they went down to the conference office and turned in their letter of resignation. And by faith, they moved to Canada, and God clearly led. In fact, and there's another story, I won't get into all the details, but long story short, uh, they started applying for the, the visa, they were going through all this process, God was telling them to move, and they end up going, because this visa process was taking a long time, and God was telling them to cross the Jordan River, and they go to Canada to the border without a visa, which is not a good idea. <laughs> Don't try doing that. But that God was leading them. And long story short, God provided miraculously them entrance into Canada. God provided them a, a house when they didn't have any money. All these things, God was leading them. And they stepped forward in faith before talking to friends and family. Now you might say, well, doesn't the Bible say in the multitude of counselors there's wisdom? Yes, yes, the Bible does say that. There are absolutely times where we need to say, Lord, I need help here. And he tells us, talk to your friends and family. But sometimes, friends, Sometimes our friends and family lead us in a direction God is not leading us. And we need to ask God, God, where are you leading me? Perhaps, perhaps right now, someone here, one of you is making a decision. Maybe it's to, to follow the Sabbath. And the rest of your family is saying, you know what, these Sabbath keepers are different. Or, or maybe God is calling you to leave your job or, or, or be a, a missionary. God is calling you to, to share Jesus with someone that maybe, you know, the, the, all the details aren't put together, whatever it may be. And your family and friends might be influenced. I want to challenge you. 
like Elizabeth did, to not trust what people around you say, but trust what God's word says. Because God will never let you down. I invite you to turn with me back to Acts. I know we were there in Luke. But let's go to, uh, back to Acts now. And notice here, friends, what Peter says. Acts chapter five, we just read, Peter and the apostles answered we ought to obey God rather than men. Then notice verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted you to his right hand, prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Can you say amen? What, Jesus, our prince and our savior, forgives our sins. And notice verse 32. We are witnesses to these things and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those he loves. Is that what it says? That's true, but that's not what it says. God gives the Holy Spirit to everyone. Is that what it says? No. This is a challenging verse, but this is what the verse says. The Holy Spirit, verse 32, is given to those who obey him. Now that's a tough statement, that the Holy Spirit is only given to those who obey him. According to that verse, if you're not obeying God, you can't receive the full measure of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that, friends? That's a hard statement, but it's true. Right? And this makes sense. Why? You know, I, I believe that God is not going to withhold good things from his people, but if they're going to misuse the good gift, he's not going to give it to them. Right? If I know my sons are going to misuse, let's say, a pocket knife, my wife and I's parents will wisely decide, you know what, we're gonna hold off to give them this pocket knife until they can responsibly use it, until they can obey us and listen to us. If they're hiding it or they're taking it when they're not supposed to or not asking us for permission, we're not gonna give it to them. And God wants to give good gifts to those who will appreciate the gifts and use it properly. God wants to trust you as we, he wants us to trust him. He says, I will give you my Holy Spirit, the gift that brings all other gifts in its train. I will pour out my blessings on you. I ask only that you trust what I say. And the way to trust God is to know him and his character. As you get to know God, you realize that he won't let you down. A good friend of mine told me that not long ago. He said, Jeff, Jesus won't let you down. And friends, that statement has stuck with me that Jesus will not let you, can you say amen, friends? As you study the life and character of Jesus, he will not let you down. As I got to know my father's character, my, my, my earthly dad, I appreciate my dad, Greg Harper, a lot of lessons that I learned from him, but as I, as I got to know my dad growing up as a kid, I realized that I could trust him. Right, when I made mistakes, like the time that I drove his car into a, a guardrail, and I damaged his car, put a big bunch of dents in it. I knew that I could call him right away because he wasn't gonna chew me out. I trusted his character. As we get to know God, we can trust his character, friends. But the question is, how do we know that we know him? How do we know that we really know God? I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles. Um, do I have it here? I don't think uh, quite yet. Let's go ahead and go to 1 John. It's not there on the screen, but 1 John. 1 John, our scripture reading. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm so thankful for the Apostle John because John gives us some valuable lessons into uh, what it means to be a Christian, what it means to walk with Jesus that no one else scripture does. I believe that, that John had a close walk with Christ. In fact, if you wanna read a powerful chapter, read, there's a book called Acts of the Apostles and read chapter 55. Write that down, chapter 55. Some of you have read it before. It's called Transformed by Grace. And it compares the disciple Judas to the disciple John. Powerful how Jesus changed this disciple. And, and, and John, this disciple whom Jesus uh, change ends up giving us these powerful words. And we'll go ahead and start in verse three. Now by this we know that we know him. How do you know if you know God? By this we know that we know him if we do what? Keep his commandments. Notice verse four. 
He who says, I know him, I know God, I love God, I'm a follower of him, I go to church, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. How do we know that we're in Christ? He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. Are those beautiful words? If you truly want to say, I am a follower of Jesus, I want to follow him all the way, I love him with all of my heart, then make it your aim to walk as Jesus walked, to live as Jesus lived, to think as Jesus thought. I was about to say, as, think as Jesus thinked, right? That's not a word. To, to think as Jesus thought. Right? To walk as he has walked. And I want to give good news to us today, friends. Some of you may be thinking, you know, it's hard to be a Christian. It's hard to walk in faith. And I want you to know that God doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the cult. That God is willing to and able to and wants to give us strength and power to obey. When we look at the Ten Commandments and we say, God, how can I? How can I keep your law? Jesus steps in and says, I will give you strength. When we make that commitment to surrender all to him, then Jesus gives us the strength. That's why we're told in a great book called Steps to Christ, one of the best books on how to be a Christian, how to follow Jesus. We're told this, that obedience is the true sign of discipleship. And notice what she says in the middle, that obedience, the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. And I believe, friends, that that is a key statement, that if you really want to know who a disciple of Jesus is, it's not whether they come to church. If you want to know who a true disciple is, it's not whether they, we can make a list of everything else. But obedience is the true sign of a disciple. Notice what uh, the book goes on to say. It says, instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to obey. I love how that statement is rendered, friends. This is powerful. Faith in Christ does not release men from obedience. And sometimes you hear that in Christianity. Have you heard before, we're free in Christ? Have you heard Christ nailed the commandments to the cross? We don't have to keep them. Have you heard before that the Ten Commandments are part of the old covenant, not the new covenant? But Jesus says something different. He says, if you love me, if you know me, then I want you to walk as I have walked. I want you to obey me. Faith doesn't release us from obedience, but it enables us. In fact, faith requires us to obey. But notice, friends, that faith doesn't say, if you don't obey, I'm going to kill you, right? Faith doesn't come down with a hard line and say, you know, uh, you know what, you're a, a worthless human being because you're not following me. No, faith doesn't say that. That's not how love works. Obedience is the allegiance of love. Faith says, I do what he asks because he knows what is best. And friends, this is why obedience matters. Obedience matters because God knows better than we do. Amen. Obedience matters because God knows best what's for our good. He knows what's best to put in our bodies, so we should obey his health laws. He knows what our time schedule should be, so we should allow him to organize our schedule and wake us up. He, he, he knows what is best for our good, and so we trust his words and not ours. Notice Steps to Christ spells out two different errors in Christianity. There's two errors in Christianity. One error says, I can save myself. The other error says, you know what? Yes, I can't save myself, but you know what? I don't need to keep God's law either, right? But both of those are errors. Uh, let's continue reading here. There are two errors against which the children of God, particularly those who have just come to trust in his grace, especially need to guard. The first already dwelt upon is that looking to their own works, trusting to anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. That's an error. 
He who is trying to become holy by his own works and keeping the law is attempting a possibility. Is that what's said? Impossibility. All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. It is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. Can you say amen, friends? We cannot save ourselves. We know this, uh, uh, this, 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 uh, this idea well, right? I can't save myself through good works and commandment keeping. In fact, Ephesians 2, chapter 8. Let's, let's go there uh, uh, quickly. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Many of us are familiar with this verse. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Right? We're told these very true words. By grace, you have been saved through faith. This, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of worst, works, lest anyone should boast. Right? If we could save ourselves, we would take pride. Look at this. I just pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Look at what I did. We cannot save ourselves. We have no righteousness of our own which to meet the claims of God. But the good news, friends, is that if you give yourself to Jesus, if you surrender your heart to him, when you confess your sins, this is powerful, friends, righteousness by faith. If you accept him as 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 your savior, though sinful as your life may have been, you are accounted righteous for Christ's sake, is what Steps of Christ tells us. That is righteousness by faith. That his character stands in the place of your character and you're accepted before God as if you had not sinned is what Steps of Christ tells us. That's a powerful thought. To think that I can't save myself but when I come to Jesus and say, Jesus, please save me out of this pit of sin. That he stands in front of me. But once I start walking in grace, once I start living for him, there's another error we need to be careful of. And look at verse 10, friends, in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Since we're created in Christ for good works, once we've been saved, then God wants us to walk in obedience, to walk as he has walked. And so, notice what we're told in Steps to Christ. The opposite and no less dangerous error is that belief in Christ releases us from keeping the law of God. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. That's an error, friends. It's an error to say my good works and commandment keeping have nothing to do with redemption. Well, they do. Even though commandment keeping doesn't save us, Commandment keeping is the fruit of our walk with Jesus. It is the fruit of our love for God. Our works and our commandment keeping are a symptom of what's in our hearts. If we truly believed, if we believed him with all of our hearts, we would naturally keep God's word. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. And we can say, well, I believe. But what does that belief look like, friends? Because the Bible says in James 2.19, you believe that there is one God, you do well. Right? Basically, James is saying, all right, you believe there's one God, good for you. So do the devil. Right? So do the demons. They believe and tremble. It's not just an intellectual belief. It is an all-in love for God. James goes on to say that faith without works is dead. How many of you have heard of the German pastor and theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Right? Several of us have. He is known for his staunch resistance to Nazi dictatorship, and he was jailed for some time. And he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. And notice these words, friends. He said, only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Right? If, if you say, I believe, I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe in him, the natural thing is for you to do what Jesus did. If I say, I love my wife with all my heart, I'm so thankful for my wife, I'm so thankful for who she is, I believe that she is my spouse, but then I go off and do what I want, and I don't listen to her, and, we, and it's not a, a, a joint relationship, right? <laughs> then that's not true love. 
God says, if you believe in me, then that's where obedience follows. I, I want us to continue with this quote from uh, uh, Bonhoeffer here because it's a, it's a powerful, powerful quote. And it's long, it's several slides, but, but stay with me here. He says in his book, Cost of Disciple, he says, are you worried because you find it so hard to believe? I've worried that before. It's sometimes hard to be a Christian, hard to believe. No one should be surprised at the difficulty of faith if there's some part of your life where you are consciously resisting or disobeying the commandment of Jesus. If you are consciously going against God and resisting him, and I know, friends, there are some here today that God has been convicting you of something in your life that you need to give up for him, some obstacle, some roadblock, and you keep on going back to it. It's gonna be hard to believe. Is there some part of your life, he says, which you're refusing to surrender at his behest, some sinful passion, maybe, or some animosity towards someone, some hope, perhaps your ambition for money or other things, or your reason? If so, you must not be surprised that you have not received the Holy Spirit. How, why am I not following God, right? Or why am I not close to him? I feel so far from him. That prayer is difficult, that your request for faith remain unanswered, right? Why are my prayers going unanswered? Go rather and be reconciled with your brother or your sister. Renounce the sin which holds you fast, then you'll recover your faith. If you start to walk in faith and walk in steps of obedience, then your faith will be recovered. If you dismiss the word of God's command, you will not receive his word of grace. It's a powerful thought, friends. This is how he, he uh, uh, ends this section in his book. How can you hope to enter into communion with him when at some point in your life you're running away from him? That's a fair question, uh, all right? A, a question that I've realized in my life, times where I've been running away from God, pushing away from him. How can I get close to him if I'm pushing away from him? And then he says kind of what he said earlier, the man or woman who disobeys cannot believe, for only he or she who obeys can believe. Wow. Obey and you will believe. Belief and obedience, friends, go hand in hand. Obedience and salvation are connected. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter seven. Now here in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus finishes up his famous Sermon on the Mount. This sermon is the sermon of all sermons. How many of you would have loved to hear Jesus preach a sermon, right? Ah, oh, that would have been amazing to hear Jesus give this powerful sermon. And, and, and Sermon on the Mount, right, is considered, even among atheist scholars who study the Bible, isn't that an oxymoron? There are atheist scholars who study the Bible, <laughs> but there are. And even among people like that who study literature and who study literary works, right? They call the Sermon on the Mount one of the, the greatest pieces of, of literature and the greatest oratory you know, sermons there is. And, and Jesus brings the people that he's speaking to through all these powerful uh, uh, illustrations and, and through this powerful content. And as he comes to the end of chapter seven, this is his chance to bring home the sermon. This is the chance to, to bring home his words. He saves the punchline for the end. The sermon is about to be finished. All the applause is done. And I wanna tell you this, friends, before we read this, that if Jesus would have chosen to share this, what we're about to read, at the beginning of the sermon, people would have walked out. Now that, that's, a, that's a preacher's nightmare, right? If a preacher is preaching and people are walking out of the sermon before he's done, oh, what did I say? They would have walked out of that sermon if they would have heard what Jesus said here at the end. But Jesus saves the punchline for the end because it's that punchy, because it's that impactful, so they won't forget. Verse 21, Jesus says, Jesus says, the God of grace, the God of salvation, the God of the cross says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Imagine, if you will, friends, that you work for a company whose president found it necessary to travel out of the country. Right? He spends extended periods of time abroad, away, and so he says to you and the other trusted employees, he says, listen, I'm gonna leave for a while, but I'm gonna trust you with the company while I'm gone. And I want you to pay close attention to the business, I want you to manage things while I'm away, and I'm gonna write you regularly so that you will know exactly what to do. I'll write you letters, and you'll know exactly how to conduct the business of the company. He leaves. He stays gone for a couple of years, and during that time, the president writes often. He communicates his desires and concerns, and finally, finally he returns. He walks up to the front door of the company, and he immediately discovers in front of his company that everything is a mess. Weeds are flourishing in the flower beds. Windows are broken across the front of the building. The gal at the front desk is dozing at her desk. Loud music is roaring from several offices. Two or three people are engaged in horseplay in the back room. And instead of making a profit, this business has suffered great loss. And without hesitation, the president calls everyone together and says, what happened? What happened to my letters? I, I told you what to do. And the employees say, oh yes, we have all your letters. In fact, we even bound your letters in a book. In fact, we read your letters every single week. We come together to the same place and we read your letters. In fact, some of us have memorized them. Those are great letters. What would the president say, friends? He would say, well, what did you do about my instructions? What did you actually do about my instructions? And no doubt the employees would respond, well, do, we didn't do anything, but we read every one. We believed them. Friends, I believe that God doesn't want us to just listen to and believe his instructions, but follow them. He, he wants us to do what he's asked because he knows what is best for us. So Jesus says here in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many people will come to Jesus on that day. What day is that talking about? This day that Jesus speaks of is judgment day. Yes, judgment day, the second coming, when you can't go back, judgment day. And on that day, they come to the judge, the final decision maker. And the basis of the judgment, the basis of their salvation and their redemption, what is it? Well, Jesus tells us here, they say, in your name, we performed miracles. Well, that's not the basis. In your name, we did great things for you. In your name, in your name, in your name. Jesus, we got your name down. Jesus says, good for you. Many people will say to me in that day, in your name. And friends, it is very popular today to wrap the name of Jesus around anything and everything. It's very popular. Jesus is a popular guy. Well, let's, let's do this in the name of Jesus. But friends, there are so many things that have been done in history in the name of God that are not from God. Just because we proclaim the name doesn't mean that we're doing it in his name. And I believe, friends, in the name of Jesus. Right? Acts chapter four, verse 12 says, there's no other name under heaven given among men which we must, we must be saved. I, I believe in the name of Jesus. We need to trust in Jesus' name. But is the name of Jesus enough? And apparently, according to Jesus, not me, it's not. Jesus rever, re, reserves some of the sternest words in all of the gospel for the last of his sermon. We often fly right through it and miss these words. He reserves them for last. Verse 23 Verse 23, then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now this is stressful, friends. Right? This is stressful. What do you mean? What do you mean you don't know me, God? You know the hairs on my head. What do you mean you never knew me? 
But maybe, friends, there's something deeper than being on a first-name basis with Jesus. We protested social justice in your name. We came to church on the right day in your name. We were deacons and served in the right name. We, We held church positions in your name. Jesus, we've done all these great things for you. Jesus, what is wrong with you? And Jesus says, no, what is wrong with you, my friend? Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do my heavenly Father's will. Jesus says, if you love me, you will walk as I have walked. He goes on to share this powerful parable about a a wise man who actually does what Jesus asks and he builds his house upon the rock and that rock remains firm in the storms of life. But then someone else who hears the sayings but doesn't do them and that person's castle, that person's life, that person's foundation goes away. You see, friends, we see in the Bible that there are only two ways. There's two trees in the garden. There there are two foundations, there's two builders, there's two classes of people, the saved and the lost. Two, two, two. The world says today there's more options, there's more choices. Even the evangelical church says, hey, you know what, we need to unite all these little truths together, this truth and this truth, and if we just bring us together in, in unity, we can get along. But that's not what Jesus says, friends. Jesus says there's two choices. One is right and one is wrong. And of those two choices, Jesus is the best choice. Jesus' word is the best choice. And I believe, friends, that in these times that we're living in, that Jesus is inviting us into a call of radical obedience for him. Jesus ends his sermon in the Sermon on the Mount with a plea for his listeners. Don't just hear these parables and these stories and these sayings. Don't just hear them but do them, put them into practice. I'll enable you, I'll empower you, I'll write my law on your heart. In fact, I'll even do heart surgery on you. Wouldn't that be crazy if we go to a doctor, and maybe some of our physicians here have had this happen before, and and, and we go in and say, and the doctor tries to prescribe us something, it's what's best for us, and we say, you know what? Nope, I know what's best for my care. And obviously there's situations where, right, sometimes healthcare doesn't always know best. But you get my point in this illustration, right? You get my point. That the doctor, right, who knows the management of this case, trusts the physician. And sometimes we go to the master physician, Jesus, and we say, I know better. But Jesus says, I know what's best. Trust your all to him. I will even do heart surgery. I'll do whatever it takes to empower you, to enable you. I want to give you my Holy Spirit, all that I ask is that when I ask you to do something, when I call you to do something, that you listen and obey. And so church family, here's my plea. As someone who is learning how to obey myself, as someone who is learning how to listen to the voice of Jesus, here's my plea for each one of you. Ask Jesus, ask God. Go home and ask God and say, God, what are you calling me to do? Ask him, he's gonna tell you. Ask him, God, is there anything in my life that's preventing you from speaking to me? Is there any way that I can hear your voice more clearly in my life? Those two questions. God, is there anything that you're calling me to? Is there anything you want me to obey that I'm not doing? Anything that you're calling me? What is that, God? Let me know. Second thing, God, is there anything in my life that's preventing me from listening to you? How can I hear your voice more clearly? And I believe, friends, that if you ask God those two questions, he's gonna tell you what he wants you to do. God has been doing that in my life lately, revealing to me in my own life things that I didn't think were that big of a deal, but showing me, you know what, that's preventing you, Jeff, from listening to me. And I believe, friends, that whatever God is calling you to do, whether that's to keep the Sabbath uh, 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 better, whether that's to... Uh, you know, go, go against what your family is saying or whether that's, you know, to, to wake up in the morning and spend time with him or maybe, it's, maybe God is calling you to share and witness at work and, and it's hard because no one else is a, a Christian there and you're like, God, I, I don't know if I can. Whatever God's calling you to do, he's gonna empower you to do it, friends. And I wanna challenge us as a church family, challenge myself to obey him, to obey him. Trust and obey 
For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn. Dr. Tryon, come on up. Let's sing together, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. bow our heads. Father in heaven, we desire to trust and obey the name of Jesus. We desire to trust and obey you. And Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us strength to walk as you have walked. You would give us strength to love as you have loved. You would give us strength to share and preach and teach as you did. Father, give us a boldness to go out and share your words with a fallen world. Father, you are coming soon. And Lord, in these times that we're living in, these tumultuous times that we're living in, Father, forgive us for not trusting our commander. Forgive us, Lord, for trusting in our own abilities to guide the ship. But Father, we trust the captain of our souls, Jesus Christ, today. And we know that you will lead us safely into the heavenly harbor. So we give up control, we give up our way, and we choose your way today. We love you, thank you for loving us first, and we pray these things in the name and blood of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. We hope that you have a blessed Sabbath. You're welcome to join us for fellowship lunch if you can. Mm -hmm.